mental state?
revival. And part of me wanted to say something snarky, like, well, except for the magical thinking part. But then, <laughs> part of me knew too that that would have been just as snarky as walking up and saying, so, what kind of church is this? And the goal is to get to that place where, while that might, where, well, that is a valid question. Mm -hmm. um, it's a valid question when we want to know what kind of place this is. And it's perhaps a less valid question when we either want to be able to dismiss it or at least say that it doesn't have anything to offer that we're not already experiencing. And, and that the reason we do that is because that puts us in an uncomfortable place. If we can't be comfortable feeling or more correctly, even knowing that we don't know everything there is to know, and that's okay. Then every time a new idea comes along that challenges us, we'll find a reason to shut it down and dismiss it. And I'm not saying I'm exempt from that. I certainly do it as much as everybody else does. So, what's going on in some of these stories? Whether it's Paul and his half claiming a mystical experience and half attributing it to somebody else, and it doesn't really matter which it is. If we haven't had that experience, you might say, well, that's not really valuable. Or if you've had that experience, you might say, well, that's valuable, but mine is better. <laughs> and, and there's something about human nature that doesn't just let us say, well, we'll just leave it alone. And then, hence, the, the first reading from uh, the Buddhist te BuddhismTeacher.com, tolerance is preferred over bigotry. There's so, a bumper sticker. Maybe, what's that? There's, there's a bumper sticker. There's a bumper sticker. And it might even be tolerance is preferred over judgment. And we could talk a couple weeks ago, I think, if I remember right, about the difference between discernment and judgment. That it's necessary to discern things. Mm -hmm. Discerning things says this is different, this is the same, the stoplight's red, it might be a good idea not to go. <laughs> Discerning evaluates what's around us and interprets it not with an eye towards finding a way to dismiss it, but just towards gathering the information. Some of it may be useful and some of it may be not, but what we find less than useful might be quite helpful to somebody else. And what happens when we're confronted with things that go against our expectations or our experience is that we say, so look at Mr. Big Shot. We um, find that we look in the mirror in the morning and say, well, I really haven't changed. And yet we look at people that we've known for 30 years and maybe haven't seen in a while and go, oh my gosh, but I sure am glad I'm bearing up better to aging than they are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it all sort of does the same thing. It all sort of wraps around back at trying to make ourselves feel better not necessarily than somebody else, but about ourselves. So suppose Jesus sent out the 70 or the 72 or however many he sent out in this story. It's not really important. And they really did anoint people with oil and they were cured. Great. Suppose that that never happened. And what Mark is trying to do is use this story to tell us something about who Jesus was. Great. In the end, does it really matter? If we set ourselves up with an expectation that says that the scriptures of every tradition will read, will read like today's New York Times or Washington Post, we will be disappointed every time. No one did. Or every time. <laughs> but if we set ourselves up to say, there's some experience that's trying to be conveyed here. And it's less important how the author is trying to convey it than that we get at what the author is trying to convey. It should be really reassuring that the people from, even from Jesus' hometown said, look at Mr. Big Shot. Because it indicates 
that even Jesus underwent some pretty dramatic transformation between the time he left home, whatever that was, and the time he returned. Now, that would scandalize some people, that very notion that Jesus didn't, you know, pop out of the womb perfect. But the vast majority of scriptural evidence seems to indicate that that isn't what happened. That despite the apocryphal stories about him pushing dirt together and spitting on it and making a bird fly away, um, those things are perhaps best understood as trying to say something about who Jesus was than trying to report something about what Jesus did. So, in the end, we all have spiritual experience. It might be at the death of a loved one. It might be at the birth of a loved one. It might be seeing an accident on the side of the road. It might be watching the sunrise. It might be seeing a friend we haven't seen in a long time and avoiding the urge to say, look at Mr. Beekstein. But whatever it is that touches our heart, from something really significant that rarely happens to something really significant that happens every day. The, the spiritual task is just to remain open to it. The spiritual task is to resist the temptation to say, eh, that's not so special. We'll put it over here in this pile and then we won't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. The spiritual task is to get to the place where it's just okay. And where everything is just okay. Even the unpleasant stuff. Because we come to recognize that the unpleasant stuff is not avoidable. It's all part of life. And getting to an even and more balanced place where we don't feel we're, you know, in the produce section trying to avoid the, the peach that's just a little too ripe. And where we can just take it all in. Because part of getting to that place, I really believe, where we have those mystical experiences involves taking it all in and letting it sort itself out as we carry it with us. And that way we don't have to go chasing after the really special stuff, but we can see that the really special stuff arises out of the everyday. And it's really a lot easier and we really can relax a lot more if we just allow ourselves to take it in and hold it gently. Thank <laughs> you.